Hello America, I'm James Robinson. I'm in for Glenn Beck on assignment, and he'll be back with a lot of news you'll want to hear. You don't want to miss Glenn anytime on GBTV. I never would have believed that I would be standing in as a Protestant evangelical in a studio that is hosted by a very caring American, I think a great man, not only highly gifted, but one who has concern for all the right issues. He's a Mormon. Mormons invested time and love in his life and helped him walk through addiction and alcoholism into a new life. We've become very good friends. But if you had told me as a Baptist evangelist that I'd be standing in Glenn Beck studio and I'm about to talk to a Catholic and then we're going to be talking a little bit later to a businessman who his family grew one of the largest businesses in the world. And then we'll be talking to a pastor from the largest or one of the largest churches in Russia located in Moscow. I want you to know that if you grasp what we're going to be sharing today and you get the significance and the importance of this book being George Washington, and then I'm going to be talking to you about this book, Indivisible, which I wrote with Jay Richards, that I believe is going to help redirect us out of our present day wilderness into the land of hope and promise and yes, prosperity. These two books, if you grasp the truths in the books, I can promise you we are going to correct our national course and many of you are focused totally on an election and it's one of the most important in my lifetime and I've been here 68 years. But there's something that is even of greater importance and that's understanding the direction that we must go and the corrections that must be made. And we've got to put people in place who understand direction and necessary correction or we don't have a secure future. I believe there is hope, but I believe we're running out of time to make the necessary change. During this program today, we're going to be talking to you about very specific issues that should be a great concern to you. Many of you may wonder why this book is so vitally important. Because if we become, as Glenn is seeking to impress upon our minds, if we become what Washington was, and I, I really appreciate the way Glenn points out that he was flawed, he was not perfect, but he developed character traits that are so vitally important at any trying time in any history of any nation and any person's life. We're going to be talking about that. I think that when Glenn and I got to be good friends, and, and we really are, it was one of the most uh, not only important moments in my own life and in my journey, but I feel like it was in many ways one of the most important moments in my life for all the people that I love and I'm concerned about. I am the father of three children and 11 grandchildren. And I really do love our family, and our family is very, very blessed. And I think we're blessed because we've made some very important decisions, and we made them wisely. I think we made them with divine direction. You hear Glenn talk about the importance of God and in his own journey, how God became important to him, and also how he recognizes that God is our only way of guidance, direction, divine providence, as George Washington put it, out of the, uh, the dismal pit that we dug with poor choices and lack of principle. God directed my family because we sought him. And because we've been blessed, there's, there's a real tendency sometimes to just settle in in that, the light of that uh, and the benefit of the good decisions you make when you walk with divine guidance. Jesus said something very, very important. He said, we're light and don't hide the light. Don't let it get hidden under a bushel or any covering. Put it on a lampstand. Here's what I've detected among many people who have a good life, a good Christian life. Their faith is important. Their family is important. They have all the right things in place. They work hard. They're responsible. I have found that many of these people make a big mistake of living in the blessed radiance of the light 
of those decisions and they fail to be a light that pierces the darkness. And as a result of that, people are making decisions that determine our future and the future of our children. And they're passing policies that encumber us and burden us down to the point that we're going to find ourselves so heavy laden by the results of these decisions that our families do not have the opportunities many of us have been blessed to enjoy. When Glenn Beck wrote this book and began to encourage people to read it, I, I have enough respect for Glenn because we have developed a very meaningful relationship. I've had a lot of my friends in evangelical churches say, how can you be close to someone who, you know, is a part of the Mormon faith or they helped him and he identifies with them. Well, because I got to know Glenn and I, I follow a, a savior who says we're to love all people and we're to be a light that illuminates the way, correction, the way to walk, the correct way to walk, the things to avoid. I don't think we can effectively talk to anyone and communicate with them if they don't believe we love them. Glenn knew the first time we met that I had his best interest in mind. I cared about him. There was a love connection there, and we began to communicate and talk, and we found out that we know Jesus, that Jesus Christ is real in our lives. I know many Baptists. I became a Christian in a Baptist church. I know many Baptists who don't know Jesus. In a few moments, I'm going to be talking to a Catholic. I know many Catholics who don't know Jesus. I'm sure there are Mormons who do not know Jesus. I'm sure there are some people who teach things that don't actually point you to the truth, even in religious settings. That's another thing I appreciate about Glenn. He says, let's keep pursuing truth. Let's keep looking for the truth. Let's be on a, a continual exploration journey to find truth and apply it and allow it to have its transforming effect in our lives. Well, when he pointed to George Washington, he made it very clear. I'm not pointing to a perfect man, but a flawed man who did some things right and he is rightly called the father of our nation. I really loved one of the stories here that he recounted, and Glenn may have told you this, but it really made an impact on me because you know that Washington continually talked about divine providence. It was a big thing to it. His father went out, unknowing to George, and planted with cabbage seeds his name in the garden. When the cabbage grew, he took his young son out, and you know his father died when George was still relatively young. He took his son and he showed him his name spelled out with a cabbage. And George looked at it with amazement, and his father said, Son, that's just happenstance. And George looked at it and he said, No, that did not just happen. Young George learned a lesson about divine providence. I think it is critically important that we come to understand what George Washington knew. George not only had, the father of our nation, not only had divine protection, he had divine guidance in the decisions that he made. He walked with a humility and a dependence upon God. He had some character traits that are going to be critically important for us if we're going to right this ship of state and return ultimately to safe harbor. And I'm telling you, we're in serious trouble. I do not have an apocalyptic attitude for one moment. I don't think it's too late. I think it's later than most people think. And I will say to you that without divine intervention, I do not believe we will make the right decisions. I do not believe we're going to have the character to live up to the things that we know are important. We're not going to have the character, the courage, the commitment, and the conviction, and the compassion necessary to go with all of those character traits to make the corrections that are absolutely essential for us to have a secure future. We are in serious trouble. And many of the scenes that you see around the world are a reflection, and I think they're a small picture of what will happen in America if we don't turn back to God. Because we have turned away from great truth, and literally we've sinned against great light. And we have to come back to God. When God led me to find someone to assist in the writing of this book, Indivisible, Restoring Faith, Family, and Freedom, before it's too late. Through much prayer, God led me to the person to join with me. We found our hearts and our minds were literally united in the spirit and love of God. I found Jay Richards. 
a PhD from Princeton, a brilliant academic, a great student, formerly a liberal, socialist, frankly a Marxist in his beliefs, totally transformed with the power of God, went on a wonderful journey, and we realized we were to write this together. It's been quite a journey. It emphasizes the importance of unity. Jay is a Catholic. Jay, I'm glad you're here with me today. Hey, it's great to be with you, James. Who would have ever thought it? No, I know at the time, I mean, we talked almost two years ago. I, at the time, I thought, boy, this seems so improbable, but for the pro providence of God. You called me almost out of the blue after you'd read my book, Money, Reading God, and another guy, Jim Garlow, a, a Wesleyan in California, had connected us. It was just, it's just absolutely amazing. Well, what do you think about that reference I just pointed to here on the Time magazine of George Washington being the great uniter? You know, you don't hear that reference. Well, you don't. You know, but what's funny about George Washington, of course, there's a, it's said that if he had wanted to at the time when he was president, he could have become king. Uh, it, one of the, the signs, I think, of his integrity and of his, his honor and, and, and character is that he stepped down sort of devolved power, handed it off to someone else and returned to Mount Vernon in Virginia for a peaceful life. That's one of the things that makes our country unique, is a willingness of men and women to serve, but also to hand over that service and that leadership to someone else, rather than confiscating the power for themselves. That's what happens in banana republics and dictatorships, in which one man gets power for a little bit of time and figures out what does he have to do to retain power. We've been blessed not to have leaders like that for over 200 years. Do you think that it's in some ways unique and yet critically important the fact that I even opened the show talking about almost how unbelievable it is that a, an evangelical Protestant standing in a media highly visible figure studio mm -hmm. who happens to have a Mormon very definite connection mm -hmm. and sitting here talking to a Catholic in light of what's going on today why does that seem to me to be so important? Why do I think that's important? Well, I know we both feel it's almost eerie because, of course, one of the themes in our book, Indivisible, is that if we're really going to restore the culture, people that have sometimes been arguing amongst themselves, you know, Catholics and Protestants, you look at American history and spend a lot more time sort of attacking each other than working together. Certainly Catholics, Protestants, and Mormons have, you know, had some uh, trying times in the history of the United States, but we're convinced that if these groups, especially those that take faith and family and freedom seriously, don't start rowing in the same direction, we're in serious trouble. I mean, the, the problem is that what I'd call the secular left works in unity. They seem to be marching in lockstep together. People that value faith, family, and freedom, we tend to either be sort of minding our own business, going to our jobs, taking care of our families, or fighting amongst ourselves. And uh, I'm convinced, and I know you're convinced, that if these groups can form a unified coalition and work together on some fundamental principles in support of, of sp specific policies and ideals, that there's still time for us to restore the culture and turn the country around. Doesn't it seem that the people who understand the importance of commitment in marriage and uh, principled leadership in their mm -hmm. families and commitment within the family, responsibility in communities, work hard, make a living, try to do the right thing, live as assuming personal responsibility. Doesn't it seem to you that of all people in America, these are the people that ought to be most concerned about the direction of our nation and what our leaders in Washington do? Absolutely. I mean, that's sort of the irony. But, I mean, you and I are the same in this way. You've got your family. You have a job. You have your responsibilities that are close to home. It's easy to spend all your time focusing on that. And, in fact, we shouldn't spend most of our time focusing on that. The problem is, as you've said often, enough. While you're trying to mind your own business, somebody else, maybe in Washington, D.C., is trying to give you the business. And mm -hmm. a lot of us need to wake up fast about what's happening because we might think in our safe little uh, commune, our safe little families, uh, that nothing could ever change. Things are changing radically before our very eyes. Well, you know, one of the things that I was impressed by when I read uh, uh, your book, Money, Greed, and God, was the fact that you recognized the importance of a free market mm -hmm. capitalist system. And you, you really showed that it was in, quite in line 
biblically and that the socialist mentality was quite contrary to biblical truth. We're going to actually talk about that. One of the things that I've found is that many people who are concerned about the uh, economy and about the fiscal responsibility of problems, they don't seem to think social issues are important. And we really do, as George Gilder said when mm -hmm. he read the book and referenced it, he said we put that to rest once and for all. We settle it. You can't separate the two. And we're going to talk about that just a little more right after this. We'll be back in a moment. You know, there's no question that people are concerned about our economy, and rightly so. If we continue to look to the federal government as our source of hope and help and depend upon them, we're never going to find solutions to our problems. As a matter of fact, as Mr. Reagan said, that is the problem too often rather than the solution, and there's no question about it. You know, Jay, Jay Richards is here with me, and I'm talking to him. He is the co-author of the book, Indivisible, that I really... I really pray everyone reads because if you grasp the truths in it, it is going to so affect your thinking in your life that you're going to walk out on a, on a solid foundation, a solid footing, to be able to present the principles that you know are critically important to our future, to our security, to the stability of our economy as well as our lives. And you're not going to be able to separate a stable economy from the social issues of our day. I will say to all of you who have been successful in the capitalist free market era and you have paid enormous taxes, it seems to me Americans ought to be applauding the 1% that pay 40% of the federal tax income and, and you certainly ought to be applauding the 10% that pay 70%, but you're making an enemy out of them because many leaders are pointing at them as though they're the problem. But I want to say to those of you who have made uh, uh, a great amount of money and you're successful, I want to say to you that it's high time and it's critically important for your own benefit. And the free market is a blessing. I believe it's a blessing from God. It's critically important to our, our own maintenance of the, the right of life and the blessings in life that we all enjoy and appreciate. We are going to have to focus, those of you who are successful, our attention on the needs of people around us because government is inadequate to solve the problems. They don't know how. They can't manage the money we trust to their watch care. They do not know how to deal with the areas of poverty because you've got to have a compassion connection to effectively change anybody's life. You can't just throw money at an impossible to hit target. But we're telling people that's the answer and it is not. And those of you who make the money and who pay the taxes are going to have to see you're going to have to put some of your energy and your focus and your ability on the problems and help solve them. Or you are going to watch an awful uprising of people who will literally so oppose you that you're going to lose the blessings and security that you've had. So there is no way for you to dismiss the importance of the social responsibilities and issues. And to those of you who are in need, government cannot solve your problem. They only have what they take and they will never deal with the issues that are a concern to you until someone is directly and personally involved. Jay Richards is here with me. Jay, I have spent the last 25 years helping the poor all over the world. Mm. I came out of poverty. I'm the product of a forced sexual relationship, and yet a doctor refused to abort me, so I was born. I was born into a family that I grew up fatherless. I grew up in poverty, but no one taught me to resent people who had things, who had been successful. So I looked out and saw possibilities, and I said, the only way I can get out of my impoverished situation is go to work be responsible, earn something, and achieve. And I believe that was the great American dream. No one taught me to hate success and hate people who are successful. So I believe I have been able to achieve the American dream. But as I have succeeded, and because God's in my heart, I love people. I want to help people. I don't think our federal government is helping them effectively, however sincere some politicians and leaders may be. I do not believe many people who are successful have ever known how to look at and even rightly consider the plight of the poor, so to speak, because they've sort of been dismissed from it. What I'm seeing happen in our country today is such a misunderstanding of how the two must function in harmony, as we said in the book, indivisibly, because you can't separate the effect on each on the other. 
That's right, James. I mean, it's, especially the media loves to try to separate the so-called fiscal or economic issues from the social issues. And they love doing stories, for instance, about Christians that maybe don't like capitalism or don't like the free market. Or they'll, they'll love to talk to some so-called fiscal conservative that doesn't like the defense of marriage or doesn't like the pro-life issue. The truth of the matter is, though, if you look both at the general conservative electorate and if you look at uh, politicians themselves and the members of Congress, the social and the economic issues are not separated. In fact, as we argue in Indivisible, they, they can't be separated. I mean, what happens if, if Christians and people of faith, for instance, don't understand economics, they make this kind of simple mistake that God cares about the poor and he expects us to care about the poor. Therefore, we think, well, the federal government ought to raise taxes and help the poor. But there's a fundamental difference between charity. Charity is another word for, for love. The very nature of love is that it's voluntary and then it's direct. And so if you want a charitable act, as you said, to help someone, there's got to be a compassion connection. By definition, no matter how compassionate someone is in the federal government, they're not going to be able to have that compassion connection. And so there's a fundamental mistake to think that we can transfer and transform the charity that we're called to as people of faith to something that the federal government does. It's not a, a question of people in the government being evil. It's a question of simply not being the proper sort of agents for delivering that. Certainly the government's supposed to do something. It does have a role to play, I would say, in a strong economy. It's supposed to maintain the rule of law, keep people from killing each other and stealing from each other uh, and defrauding each other. That's what the government does. But the government doesn't create wealth. It's human beings entrepreneurs acting in freedom as creatures made in the image of God that create wealth both for themselves and for others. And so that's why as you were raised as a child, you knew that at least intuitively, that just because somebody across the street might be wealthier than you, that doesn't mean they took that money from you or for someone else. No, in a free economy, people don't have to just transfer wealth from one to the other. They can actually create wealth that was not there before. So that's a, a key economic insight that I think people of faith have to understand or they're likely to sort of transfer their legitimate compassion and care for other people to some kind of job that they, th they think the federal government's going to do. It just doesn't work that way. Do you think that we are going to be able to help bring these two seemingly divided entities and groups together to understand how indivisible and interdependent they have to be? I think we are. I'm actually very optimistic. I mean, of course, everybody knows about the economy. You know the economy is teetering. Everybody knows about the effects of the, the financial crisis. Most people have heard about President Obama's latest budget that's going to spend a, a, over a trillion dollars next year uh, in debt, in deficit spending. Uh, we're worried about the things that are happening in Europe. So what, everyone is rightly focused on the economy. But I don't think anyone have, pr would have predicted, say, two months ago, that all three sort of key social issues, religious liberty and freedom, abortion, uh, and the family would all be front page news again. I mean, the reality is we might think we're going to focus just on the economic issues or just on the social issues, but both of them matter. In fact, if anything, President Obama himself has made sure that in 2012, the social issues will matter because this health and human services mandate, which has ironically united not just the Catholic bishops, but ordinary Catholic lay people, leading evangelicals, even a lot of libertarians are now concerned. No one, you know, I, I joke that uh, President Obama has managed to do what not even the Pope has been able to do in unifying the Catholic bishops. But what's <laughs> wonderful, you know, as Glenn started, I think just today this, this campaign called We Are All Catholics Now. I mean, the reality is while the media would like you to think this is a Catholic issue or this is about contraception, uh, this is a broad religious freedom issue, and not just a religious freedom issue, but a question of freedom itself. You know, I think that what is, is actually happening could be divine providence, God showing us that we have to have one another in order mm. to address our problems. I think that uh, President Obama made a statement in the, uh, at the prayer breakfast in his comments about, about Jesus saying to whom much is given, much is required. I wonder if we have that clip. I'd, I'd like to, to play it if we, if we can. If I'm willing to give something up as somebody who's been extraordinarily blessed, <coughs> give up some of the tax breaks that I enjoy, I actually think that's going to make economic sense. But for me as a Christian, it also coincides with Jesus' teaching that for unto whom much is given, much shall be required. It mirrors the Islamic belief that those who've been blessed have an obligation 
to use those blessings to help others, or the Jewish doctrine of moderation and consideration for others. You know, somehow I feel like that uh, comment about much required, or the blessings require responsibility. I don't quite think it implies that it's required that we give it to the federal government. I, I sense that that's what he was referencing. Yeah, I don't think that Jesus was talking about the U.S. federal government when, when he said that. I mean, but notice that President Obama, he recognizes the importance of faith, at least the pretense and the appearance of faith. I mean, people may not know, but 16% of the American public actually claims to be religiously unaffiliated. More than 99% of members of Congress claim a religious affiliation. What that tells us is that politicians at least understand the importance of the appearance of faith. And so if we're going to be discerning, frankly, we have to uh, look beyond, you know, the president carrying his big Bible to church on Sunday or the president of prayer breakfast quoting from Jesus. We've got to look at the substance. And in this case, I think President Obama was doing just what we talked about a minute ago. He was trying to get people of faith to transfer their responsibilities, individuals, to help the poor and those in need. And to say that somehow that responsibility is supposed to be sort of handed over to the federal government. And in fact, those with lots of money, it should actually just be their responsibility. That's certainly not what the scripture said. It's not what Jesus intended. And I don't think anybody really fell for what I would say is actually kind of a cynical attempt to appeal to, to scripture. You know what I have found in, in ministry overseas and to the totally impoverished people who appear to be without hope that when we appeal to people in the advanced countries and certainly in the United States and Canada and Australia and many European countries where people have a sensitivity and they, they look out and see a need and they say, can I meet it? I have found, Jay, on all levels of our economic strata where you have highly successful people, even the wealthiest person in the United States, Bill Gates, and then you've got Warren Buffett on his heels who have left their wealth and, and their estate to charitable, non-government organization outreaches and so forth, which seems to me to be saying, we want to help. What we have been blessed and uh, to have, we would like to help do something. I, I don't think they'd be wise if they give it all or great parts of the federal government. I would have to question that <laughs> since they don't manage it very well. But I believe on all levels, there is compassion. There is a legitimate concern. We want to help. But if you've been dismissed from the responsibility to leave it up to someone else, then I don't think you focus your energy and your attention rightly on it. I believe, now this is just what I, I have the hope for. I believe if you point people in the right direction, you encourage them to do the right thing, they can see the consequences of the direction we're presently headed in. I believe we can make the course correction. I believe we can refocus our attention to meet needs. I believe that within the American people, and within the, the, the creative genius of God, what he placed in us, we're, we are literally capable of being co-creators. I don't think we face a problem. I don't think we have an issue. I don't think we have a concern that people could not come together in heart harmony and extending caring hands that we can't solve. I don't think we have an energy issue. I don't think we have any challenge that God's people couldn't come together with God's direction and meet that need. Absolutely. I mean, I honestly don't think that we have a problem with compassion. I talk to people, people of faith, on college campuses around the country all the time, and I very rarely hear someone say, well, I don't think I have any responsibility for my fellow human being. Nobody says that. The, the problem is that a lot of us uh, connect our good intentions and our legitimate compassion with really bad political and economic ideas so that our intentions end up getting misdirected and they actually harm the people that, that we hope to help. That's really the problem. Um, there might have been a time when people didn't care about what was happening in Africa or didn't care about what was happening in our inner cities. I think, frankly, most Americans mean well. They would like to be able to help their fellow human beings. Uh, but if we don't, we don't act in ways that actually make sense, we can ac actually end up harming people. And, that, and that's sort of the dilemma, especially, as you said, if, if you think the government's taking care of it, it's like thinking that you've given it the office so that if somebody comes to the door, you don't want to give to charity. Uh, that, that's a myth. I mean, the truth of the matter is we are giving a lot of our money to the federal government supposedly for these social issues, but we shouldn't imagine that we're necessarily helping people. In fact, there's still a great deal of need out there, in part because of what the federal government is trying to do but not doing well. We're going to take a break right here for just a moment, and uh, we're going to bring Buddy Pilgrim in in just a moment. I want you to hear a businessman's take on the things we've been talking about, uh, what we shared in the book Indivisible, also some very deep concerns that he has that he wants to express. You don't want to miss it.